most people have probably something that they've accomplished, something that maybe distinguishes them a little bit from somebody else. Um, there are people that have rebuilt cars, a skill I don't have, but something I always find very fascinating to watch. There's people that write software, write, what do we call them, apps these days. Uh, again, a skill I have never worked on developing. There are people that have painted magnificent paintings, and I've dabbled in painting, but nothing magnificent. In other words, we all have things that, that uh, we probably are distinguished from because of our accomplishments. They make us a little bit different. But then there are those people who really have distinguished resumes, distinguished accomplishments, people that have written multiple volumes, people that have recorded numerous songs, people that have accomplished great things over a great period of time. And they can really stand above everybody else. And there's nothing wrong with a person having accomplished these things. But the attitude of standing above everybody else, of thinking that we are more important because of who we are, can cause problems. I'm Pastor Tim Holscher, and we are looking at what God's provided us to get along. And Paul today is just going to look at a very practical piece of advice that he looks at himself that the way he considers himself, we should say. And we're going to see how just this very practical piece of advice is something that, <clears throat> that we all can take to heart as we relate to other believers. In Philippians chapter 3 and verse 3, Paul says, For we are the true circumcision, who worship in the Spirit of God, take pride in Christ or boast in Christ Jesus, and we put no confidence in the flesh. He says that's who we are. We don't put confidence in the flesh. Our, our focus is on, is on how we do service to God and how we boast in Christ. If you boast in Christ, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 at the end of the chapter, if a man boasts, let him boast in the Lord. Why? Because every believer can boast in the Lord because what I have in the Lord, you have in the Lord, and every other believer has in the Lord. Therefore, boast in that rather than boasting in other things. So we have no confidence in this word confidence. Is we, we do not have something that we have become persuaded is true, is, become, is valid for us, and we still hold on to it today. We don't do that. We don't put our confidence in the flesh. And then Paul says, although I myself could boast as having confidence, even in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he is confident in the flesh, he says, I have even more reason. So Paul's going to use himself as an example. If a person's going to have confidence in their flesh, if they're going to think that they're better than everybody else because of who they are, because of what they've gone through, well, then Paul says, I, I, I'm, I'm above all the rest of these people. Of course, you know, he's being arrogant, but when we're going to look at what he says, there is some truth to this. Verse 5. I was circumcised the eighth day, which is what the law prescribed. I was from the nation of Israel. They'd been the people of God uh, in, in one sense or another, really since the call of Abraham. So by the time Paul writes this, they'd been the people of God for 2,000 years. From the tribe of Benjamin, one of the two tribes that actually remained behind uh, in the midst of all of these things. And so he was from the tribe of Benjamin, the tribe in, that boasted having the, that nearness there with the city of Jerusalem, a Hebrew from Hebrews. Again, uh, a designation that was used of those people that continued to, to speak Hebrew, continued to practice a Hebrew lifestyle when other Jews under Greek domination had begun to speak Greek. And, and that doesn't mean Paul didn't speak Greek. He did speak Greek, but he held to his Hebrew roots, uh, which were important for him. Today, Hebrew roots mean nothing because we're no longer Jews or Gentiles. Anyway, that aside, Paul held on to that when some in his culture went the Greek way and adopted a Greek lifestyle and abandoned many of the things that God had prescribed for them. So he says, as to the law, I was a Pharisee. And we think of Pharisees always as bad because when we meet them in, in the time of Jesus, they're just, they're practicing the law, but they're always just being really hard on everybody else about the law. And he says, you weigh people down with burdens, but you won't even lift a finger to help them with all that. Uh, he says, so with the law of Pharisee, what Paul's saying is there, I was fastidious about the law, keeping the law. And as to zeal, did I have zeal? Well, yeah, I was a persecutor of the church. Why? Because I looked at the church as being something contrary to God and God's law. 
and as to the righteousness which is in the law, I was found blameless. This doesn't mean that Paul had never done anything wrong, but Paul did everything that the law prescribed to take care of those situations so that he would be blameless in the end. And he says in verse 7, But whatever things were gained to me, these things I have counted as a loss because of Christ. More than that, I count all things loss. In other words, we don't have to stop just with those things. He says, I count all things that are lost in view of the surpassing value, the surpassing value of knowing experientially Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things. And I count them but, but rubbish so that I may gain Christ. Rubbish sounds like trash we throw in a, in a trash bin, a garbage can but he's referring to the stuff that goes down the toilet. And he says, that's the way I look at everything aside from knowing Christ. All the other things, all the other pursuits, all the other things I, I have done, all the accomplishments I've done, they're nothing compared to gaining Christ. And then I may be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law. He says, I've had that. I'm not looking for that, but I want a righteousness through faith. Now, Paul, by, by believing in Jesus Christ, had a righteousness of God, but he wants now in his practice, he's talking about his Christian conduct here, he wants a righteousness which is through faith in Christ, a righteousness that comes from God, which is a, a based upon or rests upon faith. That's what Paul wants. He doesn't want to hold on to his past. He doesn't want to hold on to all his, his accomplishments. So let's put this in a, in a, in a, again in a modern setting. Let's say, let's say that a man has spent 60 years studying the Bible. He has, he's gone to seminary. He's, he's taken classes. He's educated himself. Maybe he's got a doctor's degree. Maybe he has multiple doctor, doctor's degrees. Maybe he's written many books. And he has this ability to take the truths of the Word of God and, and teach them. And people actually listen. And he could say, oh, do you know who I am? Or the person could be very humble, as Paul tells us earlier back in this chapter, he says, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, this empty conceit, this empty opinion, this empty reputation. See, you can do all of those things. And I'm not saying that those things are wrong. I'm just saying, but you can go after and achieve those things. And in, in achieving those, you can think that you're so much better than everybody else rather than with humility of mind regarding one another as more important than yourselves. In other words, even if we have accomplished these things, even if we have achieved these great things from not only the world's point of view, but oftentimes from other Christians' point of view, if we're able to just let go of those things and say, you know, it's more important to consider others as more important than yourself or others going, going before you in this, and then as Paul, the example we saw yesterday of Jesus, Paul, Timothy, and Epaphroditus, those four men serving as servants, acting as servants for others. Paul says, that would be the better thing. And so we come over here, he says, I want that kind of righteousness. I want that because I want to know him experientially. I want to know the power of his resurrection. I want to see that lived out. The fellowship of his sufferings, which we've been over this before. This is not his sufferings back on the cross. This is talking about his sufferings with his church right now, with the body, and being conformed to his death, which means that we are actually experiencing freedom or victory from our sin nature that wants to be selfish and wants to put myself first and wants to pursue those things that glorify me. I want to just know him, and I want to know him in the way that he shares and has been a servant to the church, which is an incredible thing, especially when we know that he's the Lord of the church. I haven't had, personally, and I'm thankful for this, I have not had a negative encounter, but there's a man I know that had a negative encounter a number of years ago in which uh, a guest speaker at their church had gotten up and had uh, a person, and I've known this person, I've read books by this person, but the person got up and made some statements, and then this, this person who was a pastor in the church approached the man quietly, he didn't do it in front of everybody, and said, say, you said this, 
doesn't the Bible teach this and this? And so I don't understand how this fits in this man with, uh, with an education, doctor's degrees, have written, have been authored books and taught in many places in front of many other people who had no idea that this conversation was even taking place, raised his voice and berated this man. Do you know who I am and what I've accomplished? And of course, it made everybody else wonder what was the problem with this gentleman that he had, you know, raised the ire of this very preeminent Bible teacher. But I've also met some other Bible teachers in my life that also have doctor's degrees, studied the Bible for many years, have written many books, and they demonstrate, at least in my experience, my interaction with them, humility, tremendous humility. And they see themselves, at least as I can tell, as a servant to others. And they may disagree if, if I would happen to challenge on Jim, not that I have, but they seem to be a person that is always willing to be teachable and continue to think about the Word of God. And uh, that's a better way to function. It's a better way to operate with regard to the body of Christ than holding on and saying, look at my resume, look at all that I have done and berating people and belittling people because they won't come in line with what we think in a moment in time. I hope that that's a very practical piece of advice along with this amazing statement that Paul has that he closes that little section out with about pursuing the knowledge of Christ by sharing in the power of his resurrection and sharing in his sufferings and letting the effects of his death affect you by freeing you from the dominion of your sin nature as you have to interact with other people. Put that to practice, especially as you encounter, encounter other believers, maybe some of them who are superior to you, maybe some of them who are less, but looking at yourself in Christ as though you're all equal, because nobody in reality is superior and nobody is beneath us in the body of Christ technically, and that's very important. Set your mind on those things, who you all are together in the Lord, so that you can have a good day in Him. And thank you for joining me.